Welcome today to our webinar um, of the nursing section of ILAE. And I want to take the time to thank our speakers today for putting together this very informative uh, webinar. Before we get going in the actual presentations, I want to remind everybody that the ILAE nursing section keeps growing every single day. We have 851 members as of February of this year across the six different regions. If you have not signed up to become a member of ILAE, um, the nursing section, please do so. You can click the link below or do the QR code. It's free if your country is a member of ILAE, and it's a way to keep up with all the news and activities that's going on. The purpose of today's presentation is to understand the role of benzodiazepines for acute seizure treatments, to assess the clinical utility of available acute treatments to address patient care needs, and to identify teaching approaches to develop a shared understanding with the patient care of what, when, and how to use an acute treatment. <clears throat> That was already up on the screen previously while you were waiting to join. We have a group of four distinguished speakers with us today. Lucretia Long from the US will be talking about benzodiazepines to the rescue, a closer look at outpatient acute seizure management, followed by three clinical vignettes, identifying some of the nursing challenges and lessons learned. The first case will be presented by Sandy Dewar, from the US. The second case will be done from Katharina Morano Duran from Chile. And the third and final case will be presented by Melissa Bartley from Australia. And I think you're gonna find them all very interesting. What's important to listen to today is why benzos are important and how nurses play a critical role here. What I want to make sure everybody understands is that benzos really have been shown to improve seizure control and outcomes with early initiation. And this happens by altering the physiology, pharmacology, and postsynaptic levels of GABA-A receptors. It was first used in 1965 for status epilepticus via IV administration. And what you're gonna to hear today from Lucretia is a variety of formulations and routes of administrations available for out of the hospital home use and self-administration, the options that are available. What you're also gonna learn from her is some of the important things to remember about time to onset and the half-life for these available compounds along with the formulations available. And this is really critical as you do your education and talk with families about what to expect in terms of response to these rescue therapies. Recognizing the timely response to a seizure is critical because we all know this will help keep the patient safe for the carer using this at home. And that's why education, training, follow-up communication, and monitoring um, on a timely basis after you've initiated this type of treatment for them is really very important to make sure the medication is used correctly for the intended use. Now, with that, we're going to turn it over to our distinguished speakers. Hi, I'm Dr. Lucretia Long, and as Nancy mentioned, my goal today is really to provide a very brief overview on benzodiazepines as rescue therapies, and really to get us to begin to take a closer look at the importance of outpatient acute seizure management. I'll specifically touch on rescue therapies, clinical pearls, when seizures become emergencies, and the importance of customizing or individualizing care, specifically as it relates to seizure action plans. 
So we know globally that benzodiazepines are not only the first line of therapy to treat seizure emergencies, but of equal importance is the impact that benzodiazepines can actually have on reducing or preventing the occurrence of seizure emergencies. We also can uh, understand that benzodiazepines and patients and healthcare um, partners who have access to benzodiazepines can reduce healthcare utilization. And of equal importance is the improvement in terms of patient and care partner empowerment and reduce fear and emotional burden, again, directly correlated with patients who have access to rescue therapies. So what are our outpatient options? And, and clearly, unfortunately, globally, there is a, a variation in terms of which patients and which providers have access to benzodiazepines. So certainly in your country, you may or may not have access to all of these formulations. Uh, we see there are four orally administered benzodiazepines. The um, estimated onset of action is anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Now, it's really important that you appreciate that onset of action does not necessarily correlate with seizure cessation. And so, for example, the oral benzodiazepines have an onset of action ranging from 10 to 30 minutes. However, there are studies that suggest that um, these benzodiazepines that you take by mouth may not stop the seizure for an hour or 60 minutes after the administration. Uh, so again, appreciate the difference between the onset of action and seizure cessation. Advantages, you guys know, for the oral, the availability and cost. Um, however, disadvantages include the potential risk of aspiration, uh, injury, you know, if that patient is biting down on the care partner's hand as they're trying to administer the medication. And it also requires first pass metabolism. Now that is a long statement that simply means that it takes the oral medications longer to be absorbed. Um, when we think about the uh, buccal, route, lorazepam and midazolam. Again, the onset is anywhere from five to 15 minutes. It has a faster onset than medicines that are taken by mouth. It bypasses that first uh, pass metabolism. Again, just means that it is uh, quickly, more quicker um, absorbed. It can be very hard to maintain the position uh, when you're administering the medicines via a, a buccal route. And so in terms of disadvantages, certainly um, you have to have access to the patient's mouth. There is still a risk of aspirating if you're not putting that medication in between the cheek and the tongue. Um, and again, you may have um, some challenges with injury if that patient is clenching down when you uh, or the care partner is attempting to administer um, the buccal route of benzodiazepine. Lorazepam is available sublingually, which means underneath the tongue. Um, the disadvantages are similar to what we see with the buccal route. Um, also with the storage, you have to store the sublingual um, medication in a refrigerator, and so access can potentially be a barrier for implementation. The nasal route, we are uh, grateful here in the States to have uh, recently two um, uh, commercially available uh, branded um, uh, nasally administered uh, benzodiazepines. Valtoco is diazepam and uh, nasolam is midazolam. We got all these lambs. Um, but um, so, so we do have those available here. They are pre-prepared uh, for patients and family members so that um, there's more rapid administration. Um, but the onset of action, as you can see, for the uh, nasally administered rescue therapies are two to 10 minutes. Again, more rapid onset of action. In general, they can be easy to use, although there are some uh, formulations of the nasally administered medicine that requires the patient or care partner to prepare it. And so that can create a lapse in time, um, leading to some disadvantages in terms of administration. Also, a nasal irritation may be one of the um, disadvantages. And if a patient has nasal discharge, then um, the nasally administered rescue therapy, there may be some challenges with, with absorption. Depending on the formulation, they can be expensive. And again, some of them require patient uh, preparation. Also, when you're thinking about customizing care, um, keep in mind that uh, diazepam, at least in the studies here, um, there was no sign of respiratory depression in the diazepam 
um, studies. And uh, in the um, nasal lamp studies or midazolam, we did see some respiratory depression. And I'll touch on that a little later when we go into clinical pearls. The other thing that's really uh, important to note is that diazepam has a, a longer half-life. And so it has a longer duration of action. So when you're thinking about patients who may have clusters, you really want to make sure that you're customizing the specific uh, rescue medicine, not just, you know, nasolam uh, or midazolam versus diazepam, but all of these rescue medicines, you're customizing that to appreciate the differences in these medications. Uh, Nancy did a wonderful job giving us a historical perspective. We know that rectal diazepam was the first uh, available benzodiazepam. You see the onset 10, uh, up to 10 minutes. Um, the advantages, availability is pretty broadly uh, available. Costs can be uh, cheaper. It also bypasses the first pass metabolism. Um, but certainly there are some disadvantages uh, in terms of the social acceptance, um, diaz uh, diastat, diazepam, not as socially accepted than some of, when compared to some of the other nasally administered rescue therapies. Uh, patients need to be positioned appropriately. Very difficult to administer this during a tonic-clonic seizure, although I do have patients that have uh, tried to do that, a little difficult to administer this medicine rectally during a convulsive seizure. Also, some rectal irritation. If your patient has diarrhea, can be super hard to confirm whether or not this diastat or diazepam has been uh, administered and absorbed uh, rectally. Clinical pearls, we've talked about the significance of global challenges and the fact, and many of you know this, um, that many of these medications may not be available globally. So certainly that creates a barrier in terms of care. Uh, even in countries such as the U.S. where these medicines are available, the cost can be a factor in terms of barriers. So um, I always tell people it doesn't matter how great a medication is if the patient doesn't have access to it. Uh, even in places where there is access, provider perception that patients don't need rescue therapy uh, is unfortunately a huge barrier. Um, also, providers not educating patients or, and care partners on when and how to use it. Keep in mind, the pandemic um, sort of taught us a lot. We can do so much virtually. You can educate your patients virtually. I typically have a um, training device, and when I'm talking about different rescue therapies, I will show uh, patients how to use that rescue therapy virtually. This is really important. There are all these clinical pearls that we think about when we're trying to determine if it's appropriate for patients to have uh, rescue therapies, um, addiction, tolerance, concomitant central nervous system medicines, risk or fear of, of respiratory depression, and um, uh, alcohol use are all factors in a clinical setting that we really need to be mindful of as we're customizing care for patients and their care partners. So limiting access, um, prevention is key. And, and education and continuing to monitor that patient for some of these challenges, um, collaborating with other healthcare professionals. If your patient is being treated by another provider, making sure that you guys are communicating is, is really, really important, again, to, to assess and to minimize and to educate these challenges. Um, tolerance, you know, making sure that you are prescribing the medication as, as um, recommended can limit these complications. So we didn't go over details about dosing. You guys can all read the package inserts, but certainly we wanna talk about some of these clinical pearls, how we might prevent and assess, educate and monitor, very, very crucial. Um, just as an FYI, again, in the um, trials, uh, at least here in the States, the uh, midazolam uh, demonstrated some respiratory depression. And um, one of the recommendations is to consider a test dose in the clinic setting. So in the midazolam, uh, studies using um, nasolam, which is, which is a branded name that we have here in the States, they actually implemented uh, test doses in the clinical setting so that they could monitor the patient's uh, response and ensure that there was no uh, respiratory um, depression. So again, educate potentially toast, uh, um, um, des, uh, test dose. Uh, the medication can be super beneficial. Um, Educating people on the potential for central nervous system adverse effects and risk of sedation, again, with alcohol use, as well as concomitant central nervous system uh, medications can be really, really helpful. Again, lifestyle and life stage. I love this. Uh, as we were preparing for today's discussion, uh, Sandy talked a lot about the importance of ensuring 
um, that you are monitoring and, and assessing the developmental stage and the patient's lifestyle. So certainly the benzodiazepine of choice will, will differ if you have a patient who is, uh, for example, at work and school. Um, the pediatric uh, population may be more willing to um, use the rectal medication compared to a teenager, of course, or, or an elderly patient. Uh, ensuring that you are assessing whether or not that patient has family support is really, really important. Again, your elderly patient who has challenges with comorbid conditions, other medications, and also maybe tremors, again, you need to talk about or start to think about and collaborate with that patient on which option is best. Uh, we know that seizure emergencies are potentially life-threatening. We also know, unfortunately, that these emergencies are under-recognized. Uh, this is just sort of a, a summary of seizure emergencies specifically related to rescue therapies. We, we all know that injury is also uh, an emergency, but this is uh, just a nice summary of, of some um, situations that can create um, emergencies that we may be able to prevent with implementing seizure action plans and, and uh, benzodiazepines. Tonic-clonic seizures, we know that is a direct correlation, particularly nocturnal with SUDEP. Cluster seizures uh, can lead to prolonged seizures. And so these are all situations that we can potentially prevent if we change our mindset about a uh, benzodiazepine utilization. Timing is key. This is one of the take home messages. If you didn't listen to anything else tonight, begin to better appreciate the importance of customizing uh, patterns for your patients. So we know that some of our gover governing uh, authorities, uh, for example, the American Academy of Neurology, um, they all suggest that uh, a duration of five minutes constitutes an emergency. I'd like you to begin to think about customizing what looks like an emergency for your patient. Uh, for example, if your patient has seizures that typically last 30 seconds, and now this seizure is lasting two minutes, uh, that's probably an emergency for that patient. Not waiting five minutes is really important as you're being proactive. Get ahead of those seizures, tailor that care to the individual, and make sure de you're defining in the same language as your patient these seizure emergencies. Seizure action plans, uh, wonderful, wonderful structure, customized tools to engage patients and their care partners on the opportunity to collaborate actively in managing their care. We know that these seizure action plans are very underutilized. Uh, there are studies that suggest that seizure action plans are uh, only uh, utilized in about maybe 30 to 45 percent of patients, and that is in general uh, in the pediatric space. So those of us in the adult world have a lot of work to do in terms of um, doing a better job with uh, utilizing these seizure action plans. Uh, very important, again, we want to prevent these emergencies. So defining the patient's typical pattern and basing the plan on the individual's presentation, super important. Some of the questions that I typically ask, and I'm very excited to learn from you guys and to hear uh, what you're doing in your practice, but how often uh, are you having seizures? Do you have times where you zone out? It's really, really important that um, you are um, being intentional about the questions because we all have those patients where we ask if they've had a seizure and they say, no, I haven't had a seizure. But then you begin to sort of um, ask more questions and you find out that, oh, yeah, I'm having those little staring spells um, two times a day. And so being intentional about questions are, are really important. Um, do you have nighttime seizures? Do you wake up with blood on your pillows, tongue bites, bed uh, wetting? Um, do you have more than one seizure in 24 hours? If so, how far apart are those seizures occurring? Again, being able to customize and individualize your patient's clinical presentation. This is just a nice uh, summary of different seizure action plans. Wanted to give you a visual. Keep in mind, this is a very brief overview, but wanted to provide you uh, with some of the action plans that are available. We use the acute seizure action plan in my clinic. This is a nice uh, seizure action plan emergency protocol uh, from our UK colleagues. I love this uh, buccal midazolam care plan. Um, and there's a care plan, a seizure action plan from our Australian uh, colleagues as well. So what works well for you may not work as well for me. So just uh, trying to determine what's best for you is great. Um, you guys are amazing. Um, nurses, we are key educators to ensure a shared understanding of what, when, and how to treat seizure emergencies. 
and actually to prevent seizure emergencies. Benzodiazepines are underutilized and are the mainstay for preventing seizure emergencies. And again, customizing, individualizing your patient's seizure action plan can improve uh, outcomes. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent overview, Lucretia. In this next part of our program, we present three clinical cases that illustrate commonly experienced challenges in effective delivery of rescue therapy. The cases reflect three different disease states in patients of different ages and how rescue therapy may be approached in different countries. A brief history will be provided for each vignette. Specific challenges will be highlighted for each case, followed by proposed solutions. As you listen, please think about possible solutions appropriate in your setting. Solutions may be different depending on the formulations available to you or how much support is available to an individual patient. My name is Sandra Dewar and I am a member of the North American region of the ILAE and I will present the first vignette. This case is that of a 43-year-old man with medicine refractory temporal lobe epilepsy who has mild co cognitive dysfunction and mood swings. His relevant history is that he was not a candidate for resective surgery. He's currently managed on two anti-seizure medicines and a rescue. His seizures consist of focal unaware seizures that occur on a daily basis but he also has clustered bilateral tonic-clonic seizures that occur monthly. These bilateral tonic-clonic seizures occur in a fairly predictable pattern in which he has three seizures over a two-day period, roughly every three to four weeks. He had a recent uh, cluster of seizures that resulted in a fall and a severe laceration of his eyebrow. The challenges for administering his rescue therapy include that he lives alone, although he has a parent close by. He's not employed, but relatively socially isolated. His seizure frequency is difficult to track as he is amnestic for most events. He is also unable to self-administer the intranasal rescue therapy when his family are aware that he's had seizures, they are determining that once a seizure is over, it is too late to administer. So there are many challenges in improving the effectiveness of rescue treatment in his case. Right now, he has been prescribed the uh, intranasal form of midazolam that became available in the US in 2021. Although he has the prescription, he has never used it. And this represents a missed opportunity to prevent clusters and injury. His unwitnessed focal events occur daily, but are clearly not tracked by him. The education which needs to be reinforced is that firstly, his intranasal therapy is not for daily use. So it's not for the smaller daily seizures he has. The dosing can be done at least once every five days for up to five doses per month. It is safe to repeat on any single day and it is an effective short-term medicine provided it is used at correct times. Secondly, the use of rescue therapy after a single bilateral tonic-clonic seizure is suggested with the goal to prevent recurrence of that convulsive episode. He was also asked to keep a diary and to record the events and to document the effectiveness of therapy. Fourthly, it is very helpful in his case, because he is amnestic to his events, to enlist family involvement. Lastly, we recommended that to provide additional supportive Therapy, to, uh, to provide additional supportive guidance. We have regular follow-up calls with him to help ensure that he, give, he used the drug at the correct times.
Hello everyone, my name is Catherine Moreno, a nurse from the Latin America section. Today I'm going to show a case about a Chilean girl. Her seizures began at eight months of life with an epileptic status while requiring ICU. At 11 months of age, through medical checkups, the mother reports a change in her seizures. She described a cephalic myoclonus deviation of gaze with a duration up to the minutes, repeating two to six times a day, several days a week, and a delay in psychomotor development is also observed. The doctor leaves a treatment of two anti seizure medication and the use of buccal mirosulam of one milliliter in the case of the seizure lasting more than three minutes or repeat more than three times a day. In Chile, the available pharmaceutical presentation of midazolam is the glass and pool for injectable administration. It is the nurse's duty to educate and train parents and caregivers about how to prepare and administrate the medicine correctly. Fear is a common element in the general population when opening glass vials and handling syringe. When to use? It is also important to make sure that this prescription is used as indicated by the doctor and not every time the patient has a seizure. How to prepare at the moment, not before. To get the indicated dose from the ampoule, you must use the syringe with a needle, but to administer the medication, the needle must be removed. In some cases, the caregiver don't use the drug for fear of injecting the child, and in others, they have injected the child's gum because no one explained to them that they should remove the needle from the syringe. It is necessary to explain that the administration is buccal between the gum and the inner sheet. In this process, how should we provide nursing support, provide confidence and keep in contact with parents and caregivers? To answer any question they may have, to alleviate their fears and make sure all instructions are carried out as indicated. This form of administration of formidazolam is effective and rescue therapy for all patient use. To teach parents and caregivers, we use this type of images. Another way to administer the drug is nasally. It is prepared in the same way, but for administration, a nasal dispenser is used, which is a device that adapts to the tip of the syringe. Nasal administration with this method is equally effective as a rescue therapy and more commonly used in adolescents and adults. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Melissa and I'm presenting the third vignette. Uh, I have an adult case and I'm from Sydney, Australia. I will be presenting a 22 year old patient who has refractory focal epilepsy with tubal sclerosis complex. The relevant history is that uh, they were having seizures multiple times a day, up to 40 times. They were on three anti-seizure medications and had multiple hospital admissions for status epilepticus. Uh, was prescribed rescue midazolam buccally and had uh, up to four uses per week. Given the frequency of seizures, multiple hospital admissions and high volume of rescue medication, the patient was referred to video EEG and this is where I met them. The patient underwent video EEG for eight days with no adjustment of anti-seizure medication and the typical seizures were recorded with no EEG correlate and no stereotypical for focal aware seizures. So the rescue medication was being used for non-epileptic seizures. This case demonstrates the importance of evaluating the use of rescue therapy. Has there been a change in frequency of use? Make sure that the seizure type is correct. So frequency, efficacy. Ensure the changes are communicated. So in our case, education was provided to mum and the caregiver with a new seizure management plan on discharge. Um, and then with instructions to contact the epilepsy nurse or neuro the outpatient neurologist 
after each use to evaluate and make sure that we uh, it was being administered appropriately. Um, and then evaluate the outcomes. Has the change helped? Uh, in our case, we're now three months on and we've not had any hospital admissions and the frequency of use of midazolam has drastically reduced. Thank you. And just to sum things up, the three vignette cases highlighted the challenges to, of the use of rescue medication, which included in the first case, underuse. In the second case, we're looking at difficulties in administration. And then the third case, we had overuse. The three vignettes also identified the importance of communication and education with families, parents, caregivers, and support people. They're the linchpin, and we have to make sure that everything we do is brought back to making sure our patients have appropriate seizure management plans in place and appropriate rescue medication prescribed and administered and evaluated. Thank you. Thank you to uh, our distinguished speakers and uh, really appreciate how um, you've been able to share with the group, you know, the application of what Lucretia had presented to us. We do have one question, which I'm going to uh, direct to Lucretia. And Lucretia, the question was, and there were two of them, which I think are very, very related, related, is uh, the seizure action plans, how practical are they? And what do you do for a given patient if they have seizures, both at home, during the night, while they're awake, at work? How do you address those differences? Mm -hmm. I love that question. It's a very important uh, question. I think I mentioned earlier that, unfortunately, the utilization of seizure action plans is, um, is relatively low. I am grateful here, again, in the States that we have a single page seizure action plan. So practically, one of the initiatives that we utilize in our clinic is to have a copy of that seizure action plan once that patient and that care partner is in the clinic setting, we literally sit down and discuss what their clinical presentation is. And if you recall from the action plan, there is a section that talks about um, triggers. There's also a section that provides a cartoon diagram of different semiology that allows the patient um, and the care partner to then customize what that patient's pattern is. So whether the seizures occur at work, um, at school, during the night, we are able to use that one-page action plan to customize what constitutes an emergency for that patient and to ensure before they leave the clinic setting that they understand what that emergency looks like for them. And also, really importantly, how to intervene, when to use rescue therapies. And in, in our country, we have you know, access to emergency services. So we also, um, on that action plan, document when it makes sense for that patient and care partner to call uh, emergency services. Um, one of the barriers, and this was um, actually, I was um, happy to, to do a, a project, a doctorate uh, project focusing on utilizing seizure action plans in an adult epilepsy center. And one of the barriers for dissemination was time. And so it is very um, important that when you're looking at trying to provide action plans for your patients that you create an action plan that is very efficient. Um, it's also really important that that action plan um, that you're collaborating with the patient and the care partner help min minimize that time and again to allow them to improve their educational efforts related to what constitutes an emergency for that patient. Again, whether it's at school, at work, nocturnally, the time of day um, may be not as relevant as the uh, ability to appreciate what looks like an emergency for that patient and that care partner. Yeah, and Lucretia, we have a follow-up question that adds on to that is how often do you review the seizure action plan with your patients? Do you have a set time or mm -hmm. is it clinically or oriented? I, I love that question. I actually review the seizure action plan pretty much every visit. And the reason for that um, is because the patient's clinical presentation can change. And so what we think may work initially may not be effective. And so for me, it's very important that we're reviewing that action plan as the patient comes in. When you're getting that history um, and, and understanding whether or not the action plan that you've implemented is effective, 
you can customize and sort of reorganize that action plan to make sure that you're meeting that patient's clinical need. So in general, that's my approach. Um, there are certain situations that would warrant, I think, um, ensuring that you're implementing an action plan. When you have a pediatric patient, for example, that transitions to the adult space, um, if you have someone that is traveling, Sandy and I talked about a case where a patient actually had a single seizure. Um, it's important that that patient has a seizure action plan and access to rescue therapy as well for a variety of reasons. So I think if a patient is in a situation where um, they may be sleep deprived, sort of adjusting that seizure action plan to incorporate some preventative measures can be very helpful. Anytime there's a change in the patient's clinical presentation, I think we should be looking at uh, reviewing that seizure action plan and also making sure that the patient understands the seizure action plan and is able to implement that uh, when they uh, go into the home environment. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the other panelists have anything further to add to that topic that you might be doing different in your practice. I would just, I think right. that's a comprehensive um, answer, um, Lucretia. Um, I would just say that I think um, certainly in the pediatric uh, community um, for children in school, the opportunity to update the seizure action plan may be necessary when medicines change or children uh, grow and increase in weight and dosages have to change um, or if there is any other challenge um, necessary. But often those plans get placed at the beginning of the school year and people don't update them. Um, it does take a lot of imagination to write a good seizure action plan. And I think you've really got to spend time talking to patients and knowing what their lifestyle is so that it's an appropriate plan. Yeah, yeah, very, very good point. I'm going to move on to um, a couple other questions. These two are related to actually drug selection. And one of them relates to making a decision between nasal and buccal administration. And the question was asked in relationship to midazolam, but I think that can apply to some of the other uh, oral benzos that may be available. Um, so maybe in a greater, broader context is when would you pick an oral versus a nasal or some other formulation? And Lucretia, I don't know if you want to take that. Sure, I can start. And then certainly the other um, speakers can kind of chime in. In general, um, I, I guess I use both the oral and the nasal. And typically the oral medications are, are used in patients who have focal aware seizures. And so I have um, several patients that only have focal aware seizures. And if they cluster, they feel very comfortable taking a PO Ativan and that's worked for them. I really like the nasal rescue therapies because they're very rapidly absorbed. They're easy to use. And we're grateful again in the States to have uh, both nasal lamb, midazolam and diazepam that are pre-prepared in a branded form. Very, very easy to, to use. Again, they're already pre-dosed. The patient literally um, just sprays. I can kind of show you. Um, spray up their nose, and it's very easy to utilize. If a patient is alert, um, then the nasal or the oral, I think, is, is appropriate. Um, I typically, of course, if a patient has a convulsive seizure, I, I always recommend the nasal uh, route. Um, again, I'm in the adult space, and so using uh, diastat or rectal diazepam is not as well um, accept it socially. And also when you think about some of the challenges with diarrhea, the idea that that patient has to be positioned in a certain way, um, certainly the nasal route of administration is quicker. We talked about that um, earlier in tonight's discussion and very easy to use. So we want easy, efficient, and effective. And so when I'm thinking okay. about a route, it I you know will often focus on those three items. But I do yeah. have some patients that like like Ativan, they prefer the Ativan uh, by mouth and it's worked for them for years. I typically say if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, but certainly if there's some altered awareness, the nasal route is, is much better in my opinion than the oral. Yeah, and then um, I know Melissa and uh, Katharina, you don't have nasal formulations available. I know in Chile, you use an atomizer. Um, Maybe both of you can address how 
you approach the different routes of administration? In my experience, again, in Chile, uh, the people don't use a lot of the national administration because it's a uh, he uh, feels fair when they put some medicine in the nasal with syringe. It's different when you start a, a pharmaceutical preparation to nasal. Is uh, the uh, feel more secure mm -hmm. for from that the other way, but uh, when the seizure, when the patients to refractory epilepsy, when they use for a long time this type of uh, rescue medicine, uh, use the nasal uh, route uh, from this prepared with uh, the atomic cell. Gotcha. How about you, Melissa? You're on mute. With, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I'm with Catherine. I think that uh, we use both preparations and often the decision making comes down to a discussion uh, with both the patient, the caregivers uh, and the administrators as to which is going to be more practical for them to use. Um, and I think that we, I, we use the five milligrams in a mil um, kind of IV formulation vials um to administer that are plastic so we don't um it uh, doesn't really matter in the sense of what's going to be used often i give the patients an option and sometimes the siege management plans the action plans have both routes of administration as being an option uh for use yeah thank you all all three of you there's a question about rectal peraldehyde which i have to be honest i haven't heard um, people using that for ages. Um, so I don't know if any of you have uh, have patients that are using it and the issue of respiratory depression. I know when I was in practice, we didn't use it because of that. And also some of the challenges with just preparing it for rectal administration. And once we had rectal diazepam gel, you know, everyone kind of went to that. But um, anybody here had any experience with rectal aldehyde? I do not. No, yeah. I haven't either. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, very, very, very old uh, use. So uh, that's all we can share at this point. I think there are a couple other questions. There was one about um, how do you deal with the patients that have both non-epileptic seizures along with epileptic seizures uh, in terms of the use of rescue medication. Any pearls there that you can quickly share in terms of dis helping a family distinguish which ones to treat and which ones not to treat? That is a fantastic, mm -hmm. very, very challenging <laughs> question. Um, that's a great question. And I do have situations where, of course, you know, many of us have uh, people with both epileptic seizures and, and non-epileptic events. I think the tough part is trying to um, get the patient to appreciate the difference between the two. And so what we typically do once we've um, documented the uh, non-epileptic event in the monitoring unit, we have epilepsy monitoring units here, we show the patient and the care partner the example of the epileptic seizure and the non-epileptic event. And that provides them with a visual so that they can appreciate the difference between the two. Um, I like to um, educate my patients and care partners to try to determine if that patient um, can respond during the event. A sternal rub, you know, can be helpful sometimes. Um, so really trying to get that patient and that care partner to understand the difference between the two and educating them on the importance of using the rescue therapy when it's clinically indicated, which is for the epileptic event and talking to them about the potential for tolerance, respiratory depression, all of these things that can be a challenge if you're using that medication inappropriately. It's a tough uh, clinical situation, mm -hmm. but I think the key is educating the patients and the care partners to appreciate the difference between the two so that, that you can then intervene um, accordingly. Yes, Sandy, you can yeah. add something to that. Yeah, I would just add, uh, Nancy, that I think um, it's important for people to understand the, um, the behavior, the seizure behavior, because there are differences in general 
and you know to try to um, tailor that to the specific event. So if somebody's having a prolonged event, um, has eye closing, has you know irregular um, limb movements, um, you can probably teach that this is more likely to be psychogenic than the other um, more focal unaware events that the person is having, which are usually briefer and maybe you know more bland. Um, mm -hmm. So I think. It does. Again, this is something which takes a lot of time. I think that coming into the monitoring unit is invaluable and you can actually show caregivers the difference between the two. Um, but I appreciate that it's not an easy, easy thing. Well, and I, I would think that there may be a difference in response to the use of the rescue medication. I, I don't know if any of you on the panel here sees mm -hmm. the difference with individuals who are using it for, you know, epileptic type seizures versus non, have you ever witnessed or get the family patient to report that the response is different? Is there any ability to tease out that way? I think the problem is that this type of patient uh, gives with the, the rescue therapy before uh, to get a, a specialty neurologist or epileptology. So uh, beware to, of the action, addiction to the benzodiazepine is more common in this type of patient. When you use uh, rescue, benzodiazepine to rescue, uh, when coexist this two type of seizure. Right, yeah. Mm. Melissa, anything from your point of view? No, I think no. it's a, it's a difficult one, and I think it's individual, and you've got to just keep working away at it, um, yeah. and make make do with the best you can. There there was a question um, in the Q and A box too about repeat doses in the outpatient setting. So I don't know if any of you on the panel have patients that often have to repeat a dose um because you didn't get the full effect and you know how do you think about those occurrences and direct families yeah i guess for me it is very um specific to the rescue therapy that i am prescribing so in the case of midazolam uh, patients and care partners have the opportunity to repeat that if needed within 10 minutes. Uh, in contrast with the nasal um, diazepam, uh, Valtoco, um, they uh, can repeat that in four hours. And um, most of the rescue therapies don't require, my experience and what we saw in the clinical trials is that they don't require a second dose. I know in the uh, Valtoco nasal diazepam studies, um, they're uh, close to 90%, maybe even a little higher, uh, did not require a second mm -hmm. dose in terms of prevention of clusters. Mm -hmm. And so in general, most people don't require a second dose, but I think it's really, really important. Again, we talked about um, the need to prevent some of these challenges that you are educating your patients on um, the recommendations that are documented in the package insert and not overusing those medications because of the risk of tolerance, respiratory depression uh, with the um, midazolam and other complications. So making sure that you're educating patients is really, really, really important. And again, customizing, and individualizing that approach so that patients know when it's safe to, to use that second um, dose of rescue therapy. Yeah, Melissa or Katharina. Look, I agree with Lucretia. I think it's it's not something that is commonly practiced, but it, it needs to be individualized. So if you have a patient that, you know, is having these clusters of seizures and they don't respond um, and you have to have this plan to be able to administer a second dose if required, mm -hmm. um, but it's not yeah. common practice. You don't teach it as a first up kind of management plan. Uh, ideally, it would be in negotiation and review. You see the person and they say, okay, it didn't work. And then you make a new plan. It's about evaluating kind of use of the midazolam and its effectiveness. And I think that kind of draws us back to what we were talking about uh, with the cases and Lucretia's mm. uh, presentation is that, you know, it's evaluating the plan and making sure it's effective. And then if it's being overused, underused um, or not effective, then we need to make a different plan. Yeah. For me, it's the same. Uh, we didn't don't recommend it to repeat the dose. 
except in very, very refractory epilepsy. Uh, it's only case uh, before to to get to the hospital. Uh, probably second dose. We have an additional question, which I think is a very good one, is what's the criteria that you use to stop re recommending or directing a patient caregiver to stop using a, rec uh, a rescue medication? How do you look at that? I have uh, one case where uh, I've been taking care of a patient for literally probably 25 years. Um, and um, she actually was receiving benzodiazepines from another provider and uh, was sort of lost a follow-up with me for a while. And she came back into the clinic and she has epileptic events, very bad frontal lobe um, epilepsy, but she was overusing the benzodiazepines to the point where none of the available benzodiazepines were effective anymore. So diastat was not effective, the Valtoco nasal um, diazepam or the nasal midazolam. It didn't make sense for her to use those because they were no longer effective. Unfortunately, she uh, frequented the, uh, the uh, emergency room. There was nothing I could give her outpatient because everything we tried, none of it worked. And she had been taking uh, PO Ativan, I think, and, and Clonopin and was just on a, a lot of different benzodiazepines from other providers. And I had talked to her probably for 15 years about the potential for tolerance. And uh, sure enough, we uh, it's a complicated case because she has real epilepsy, but I discontinued all of the, the um, rescue therapies because it didn't make sense for her to use them because they weren't working. So for me, I think that's the only case uh, right now that I can think of where I would recommend discontinuing um, rescue therapies. I mean, obviously, if you have someone elderly with COPD, um, you have to be careful with which rescue medicine you use because you want to be mindful of the potential for respiratory challenges. I would typically use probably Baltoco or diazepam because we didn't see that in the in the clinical trials. Um, but in terms of not recommending a rescue therapy, that's very rare in my clinical practice. I, I think that um, there are not very many situations where a patient wouldn't potentially benefit for, from a rescue therapy. Um, the Valtoco and um, uh, nasolam, so the diazepam and midazolam, the shelf life is, is over two years. So for me, it just gives patients an opportunity to make an informed decision. I feel strongly that our job is to give patients information about what's available so they can make an informed decision. And I can't tell you the number of patients, even those who are seizure free that say, oh my God, thank you for writing this prescription for me. I feel safer if I'm traveling. Uh, my husband feels a lot safer, even though I've been seizure free for years. And so I think um, we do our patients a disservice not mm -hmm. talking to them about those what options are available and to, again, allow them to make an informed decision. But that's been the only case I can think of where I have discontinued all um, outpatient um, mm -hmm. rescue therapies. What about the rest of the panel? I, I think, you know, I've had uh, difficult uh, situations. Is, uh, one that comes to mind specifically is a patient who was um, had a long history of drug abuse and was initially very hesitant to even have a rescue, but he has multiple seizures a day. The problem there was trying to uh, time the administration of the rescue. He lives alone, and he is. Um, it was very difficult to even know which of his seizure types would respond best to a rescue. Th rescue. Um, so, you know, I think in some respects, he probably wasn't the best candidate to carry a rescue or to be prescribed a rescue. Um, and it was some time actually uh, after the availability of the intranasal formulations that we even gave it to him. Um, but it is one of the challenging uh, examples and he calls a lot, especially when he's used, and in relation to the question of underuse, he was on 15 milligrams of the intranasal uh, Valtoco, but he was only using one spray so he was in actually only getting seven and a half milligrams so it just points to the fact that you know people need very careful instruction and a lot of follow-up after the after a, this has been prescribed when um in many cases i will have people call me for the very first time that they've used it 
so that we can review exactly the circumstance of use. So it yeah. is tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are just about out of time. I think we have three minutes left. And so before we let everyone go, because I know this will end abruptly, I again want to thank our distinguished speakers today. I think it really points out the important role nurses play in education, follow up, making sure that they understand how to use, when to use, and really work very closely with the the team and then also the family on which molecule, which formulation is really best to meet their needs and continuing to evaluate. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing some of those pearls and challenges and for such a comprehensive review, Lucretia. I do want to remind everybody too that um, you can sign up for the uh, nursing section of ILAE, please do so. And if you want to review any parts of this presentation uh, later on, you can by finding it on the post in YouTube. So with that, I think we are just about out of time here. And again, want to appreciate everybody's questions and participation. And just remember what you do really matters. Thank you.